seems like we've had a temporary outage and there may be some issues with the internet. Now as you may know and remember the internet called yesterday and he didn't sound well, he sounded slow. So we must keep in mind that he may be having problems today. That said, let me pick up from where I left off. DS-106, as a TV show, starring me, Dr. Oblivion, is in need of some introduction, some sort of bumper, kind of like you'd see on shows like The Wire, Game of Thrones, etc. So if anyone out there is interested in creating some sort of introduction to the Dr. Oblivion show, I would be greatly, greatly appreciative. I would do it, for I'm a master of all things media. But at the same time, I'm a busy man reading and thinking about the bigger concepts. That's right, I'm a concept guy. Now, back to the point. Today, we will be discussing an essay and two videos. The essay by Gardner Campbell, Personal Cyber Infrastructure, and Gardner Campbell's video that he delivered at Open Education in 2009, No More Digital Faceless, Thinking the Unthinkable. And more recently, Michael Wesch's From Knowledgeable to Knowledge Able, which was delivered here at the University of Mary Washington in May. There have been many responses to these essays and videos, or essay and video, and I've read your responses on the blogosphere, and I'd like to call up a few of those responses, discuss a few of those responses, and then hopefully through Skype, and I'm not sure if this came through clearly earlier or if I was disconnected, but Skype is now enabled within the broadcast. So when and if you call me via Skype or you call my teaching aide, Jim Groom, on Skype, and his name is Jim Groom on Skype, we will be able to bring you directly into the broadcast. And this will allow for some discussion between you and Dr. Oblivion. Now, to the comments and reflections on the pieces. We'll start with Gardner Campbell, and I have a few notes here. One of the interesting immediate reflections came from Kinsey Brooks in her blog. And she brought this idea up about Gardner Campbell's video, No More Digital Facelifts. She said one idea that Campbell had was, in quotes, finding my unmet friend. That is one of the accomplishments that I want to make after this five-week course. And I start with this quote in particular. Thank you, Kinsey, for bringing that to my attention. Because when we think about Gardner Campbell's, both his video and his essay, we could get bogged down in the technical information. What is an LMS? What is a PLE? What do these acronyms mean? Well, quite quickly, an LMS is what we might term a learning management system, often conflated with this idea in this company, Blackboard. A PLE is a personal learning environment, also termed a personal learning network. Now, rather than worrying so particularly about the tools and these definitions of environments and technologies, I like that Kinsey focuses on this idea of what they afford, this idea that Gardner brings up quite brilliantly in his discussion of No More Digital Faceless, this idea of meeting that unmet friend, of making a series of connections that in many other environments and under different conditions that may not be open would not be possible. And it's this idea not of the reality, but of the possibility of what an open online network wherein students and faculty manage 
control and think through their own work, where we have some very powerful, powerful possibilities. Gardner Campbell's essay, Personal Cyber Infrastructure, in many ways is the model, technically, in terms of environment, for how DS-106 imagines it. Many of you who started DS-106, in fact, started DS-106 a week before the class actually started. You got your own cPanel web host, your own domain, a series of social networking accounts from Twitter to YouTube to Flickr. And all these accounts in all these different technical spaces, or shall we say social spaces, in fact, taken together, and as you infuse them with ideas and art and life, begin to reflect a part of who you are. Begin to reflect what some people say is a part of what you call your network. You're framing a network out in the open. For far too long, the university has imagined this process of teaching and learning as an isolated, removed process. It's the idea of DS-106 not only to make this an open, connected, and social process, but to bring you into a state of considering and building upon a digital or online identity. In that regard, the personal cyber infrastructure becomes the architecture whereby you can build, control, and in many ways articulate technically a space that you exist within in the ether. This is powerful. And it's powerful particularly for this idea of education. One of the problems as we continue with a 19th century model of education, well within the 21st century now, is that we are further and further removing the process of thinking about these tools and technologies of control as critical citizens. By putting those tools within the hands of both faculty, students, and I would say even staff, we would hope that despite potential difficulties, and difficulties that many of you noted within your blog posts and that I will address, but despite those difficulties and potentially technical obstacles, that there is a way whereby you become more familiar with these tools, how they operate, and how in many ways they shape the environment within which we find ourselves. Now, David Gurry brought up a point, and it's an interesting point, and one that I want to address in his blog post. David mentioned that newspapers, magazines, journals in general are undergoing an idea or a crisis. And that crisis, in many ways, is based on their attempt to do a digital facelift, to take what was in print and reimagine it for the online media. Now, what he notes, and what I was a bit puzzled by, is that, in fact, universities are exceptional. They don't necessarily fall in to the same paradigm as something like a newspaper and a magazine. But if you think about the question he's bringing, newspapers, journals, magazines, they deliver an argument. They deliver information. They deliver a frame through which we understand our world. When you think about what universities and colleges do, it's quite similar. They deliver this idea of information, this question of a transferal of information. But as Michael Wesch notes in his video, when information is as abundant as it is in our moment, and never before has it been this abundant, is the role of the university to impart information? Or is the role of a university to help students filter, understand, and critique that information? And therein lies a critical difference in this idea of exceptionality that David points out with the university in many ways 
can only be grounded and justified if the university understands the changing nature of information in our day and age. I think Gardner Campbell, to get back to his point, is making the case that they haven't changed. That like the, universe, like the newspaper, or the journal, or the magazine, they've attempted to do a digital facelift for the online. They pretended to graft what works in the physical environment on top of the virtual environment. And therein lies some of the problems. Now, Andrew Whitfield, in his blog notes, well, let me go before Andrew. Let me talk to Teddy Bruzevelt, whose name I very much appreciate. Teddy Bruzevelt says the following in his post. By exposing only those who are willing and interested, the infrastructure is able to grow and support itself, referring to the cyber infrastructure, of course, and potentially and hopefully thrive, maybe eventually being introduced to the entire student body and members who are already active to help lead the way and employ a sense of cool, in quotes, that is necessary to invoke any legitimate interest, especially when it comes to college kids. Now, Teddy Roosevelt was a little bit skeptical, as many students out there were, and I hope this is part of our conversation, as you call in via Skype, were a little bit skeptical about the idea that this cyber infrastructure, this personal cyber infrastructure, would ever take hold, whether it would ever be possible. And there were these questions that maybe you could do it for a class, like we're seeing here in DS-106, or for a select few classes. But how could this be used across the university? How could this be used as a space for several classes? Well, one immediate reaction I have to that is how can we not think of a digital space that you control and maintain online wouldn't be an archive of all the work you've done as a student, as a space where you could manage, control, and preserve your work? For me, that seems obvious, whether or not the professor is using these tools. The other question, and this is a good question, is this idea of cool. How does a system, how does a framework for technology at a university be understood in terms of cool? Well, the cool factor is a difficult one to measure and to control. I understand that. But at the same time, I think by encouraging this space and by employing the idea that you need to work through a space that's yours and understand that this space is something that will frame who you are as a student, as a scholar, is something that can be encouraged, but something that can never be, in some ways, mandated. If you think about the University of Mary Washington, and you think about what they've done with their blogging system, one of the things that has made it by some degree successful is that it was never a mandated system. It was a system that faculty chose to use or not to choose. Now students may feel differently about that. Some of them may have from class to class been mandated to use that system. But at the same time, this question of cool is an interesting one that is brought up by Teddy Roosevelt. And it's one that I think DS-106 is trying to impart this idea that this space need not only be a dry, fluorescent lighted room like the LMS, but can be something that you infuse with a piece of who you are and what you represent and what you stand for. And this question of identity has come up again and again in your responses to both the essay and the videos, so we will address that. But before we do, I want to get to a point made by Andrew Whitfield in his post, and I quote, New Age of Education is programmed for discovery, 
rather than instruction. And that's Andrew quoting directly from Gardner Campbell's discussion of no more digital facelifts. Let me repeat that. The new age of education is programmed for discovery rather than instruction. Now, excuse me one minute. This idea of discovery as opposed to instruction in many ways places both the student and the professor in a profoundly different role than what we're used to. This role, in many ways, would ask the student to become an active, engaged learner, where they take control of what they're thinking, of what they're exploring, and they make it relevant to a topic for a particular class. At the same time, it would require a faculty member, in many ways, to let go of certain ideas of expertise, of certain ideas of, how do we say, coverage. And the idea that you're becoming a reference point. You're becoming a guide, a mentor, along the lines of discovery and exploration. And you both encourage and infuse that process with some kind of passion for what's going on. And the same would be expected of the students. What we have now, in some ways, is an understanding of transferal. You come, you pay your money to get a certain thing, and whether that thing is a certain bit of information to get you through the test, or an actual credential so that you make money, in many ways is a sign of the bankrupting of the passion and the system as it is. Let's face it, universities long ago have become not so much a space for true deep scholarship and rigor. They become a space for creating the next class of the professional worker. And that is something we need to balance, particularly as the money for these universities becomes increasingly, increasingly inflated and expensive. But let me get on to this point. Andrew goes on to say, the main reason that I like this quote so much, and that quote again was discovery versus instruction, because with all the new types of communication and information that is becoming available for everyone around the world, it really allows for students to go off on their own, to learn and to discover all of these new topics and put as much enjoyment and passion into it as they want. Now my question to Andrew and to anyone out there is how many of you find yourself in a class on a regular basis at the university level where you can do just what he says. You can go off and learn and discover on topics that you enjoy and put as much passion as you like. I would ask, is this the norm or is this the exception? And if the latter, why? It's an excellent point that Andrew brings to light. And my question for it would be, are we in many ways cultivating, encouraging this approach to education right now? Chelsea has another point about Gardner Campbell's point. And we do have a question from the live chat. So I'll take a moment to address that question. This is from Tech Savvy Ed. Tech Savvy Ed, thank you for joining us today. So, if UMW Blogs was successful because individuals could choose or not, does that make all forms of media publishing successful based on the individual? This is a very interesting question. And it brings up what I think is a very problematic idea of the individual versus the reflection of that individual through a community. Let me explain to you what I say because this is a point that's going to come up as I get to more of the students' points in their posts. 
if an individual believes that UMW blogs, for example, is the way to go, is that's a particular way to approach teaching and learning. And you're, of course, going to have a few individuals who want an alternative to something like an LMS. You could have a beginning, a starting point. And those individuals, in many ways, don't act alone. They act in relationship to a group like the Division of Teaching and Learning Technologies at UMW, other faculty who they've talked to. So what you have is maybe a series of inspired individuals who get excited. I think what makes it successful, Tech Savvy Ed, is a series of excellent examples that people have done and demonstrated its power. At that point, those what we might call front runners, outliers, however you want to define them, they begin to create a model that other people can see the value of and join on. Now those individuals who ultimately make the decision to join on that process, can we understand them the same way of the individual or are they kind of framed by the practice of others? I think the idea of the individual and the space for the individual is a powerful one, but one of my fears of it and one of the dangers of it is it pretends that what we're arguing for is this kind of isolation and alienation of the individual, this kind of holding up of just a few great individuals who are changing everything. And I'm not sure that's the case. That's something I'd like to think more about. I do think that these things happen in many ways communally, right? Or at least culturally. And there are a few people who might reflect that at its deepest, but in many ways, many of us as a culture are having to deal with these shifts, right? And it's reflected in all parts of our culture, whether it be popular music, movies, video games. Everywhere around us, those narratives of the shift are working themselves out right now. So to put it in one individual, in many ways, might reduce it to a theory of history that often creates the great man or woman, when I think this is a cultural issue we all need to deal with on an individual level in relationship to the world outside of us. And that will get to some of the points about identity that come up shortly. Thank you for your question, Tech Savvy Ed. Now Chelsea, in her blog post, talks about Gardner Campbell in his lecture, No Digital Facelifts, and essay, A Personal Cyber Infrastructure, Gardner Campbell acknowledges the issues present in the classroom and argues doing away with outdated technology will remedy the problem. Although, we'll see if that's exactly what he noted. I feel as though Campbell's proposal is unrealistic. This was a common feeling among students. And too far to the other extreme to be effective. The current classroom structure is too much of a contrast to an environment that is entirely web-based. Although it may seem appropriate, considering our technological dependence, I don't think the world is ready for such a change. To my understanding, the cyber infrastructure Campbell refers to in his essay can be compared to the various identities we have established for this course. Although having a course entirely online works in this situation, I don't think this method would work with every course. And thank you for your thoughtful comment, Chelsea. And I don't necessarily think that we need say every course should be either face-to-face -face or online. And I'm not exactly sure that's what Gardner Campbell was arguing, either in his essay or in his presentation. What I would suggest he was arguing is that every student and faculty member should have some virtual space that they both control and maintain as both an archive, as both of a space of collective expression, and as a space for networking with others online. Now more and more, whether we like it or not, I think we are going to see the classroom experience at least begin experimenting with the virtual space. And part of the process of DS-106 is to imagine what the limits of those experimentation are. And I think one of the problems of the LMS that Gardner Campbell is reacting so strongly to is 
the LMS becomes a predetermined environment wherein the exchange logic of education is reflected within the very code and architecture of the space. Thereby the spaces in many ways shape the experience. I believe that Gardner Campbell is so passionate about the idea of giving students and faculty their own space because in many ways this may be one way out of what has become the dominant and some might say hegemonic logic of the learning management system to control the space with which in we learn. And by extension, when you control the space, you control the experience. And by controlling the experience, you in many ways shape the education process through the technology. By imagining new ways, by exploring new possibilities, even if they may seem radical, as for many, they, many of you they did, they still open up a possibility and an opportunity. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Chelsea, for that thoughtful comment, and I hope I addressed it in some ways. Now, we have another question from the live chat, so let me take a moment to answer that. First, I'll ask it, then I'll answer it. Cheryl Colin, thank you for your question, and here it is. Dealing with shifts, culture, etc. Wesh never would have gotten so far with his ideas had he not let his students help him get there. It's a wonderful comment, and I would only say absolutely. The fact that Michael Wesh worked together with his students to not only create the videos, but to reimagine his classes, and he asked for their trust and participation, in many ways changed that dynamic of exchange. It did not become the professor gives you something and you become the receptacle of that kind of sacrosanct information. Rather, you become part of the process of building and developing the experience, the resource, and the relationships. So I couldn't agree with you more, Cheryl. And we will get to Wesh in more detail shortly. Thank you for your comment. Shana Moreland, speaking again about Gardner Campbell's essay, says the following. I especially loved Gardner Campbell suggesting about the increased advancements in technology, that they not only prove a new way of education, they also provide the student with more freedom and more power over the way they learn. And this, in many ways, is the idealistic hope. But it depends upon students who want to be empowered and who want to take more control over the way they learn. That is the problem, that is potentially the solution, and we have to understand that we are in a system, whether it be through K through 12, and I would argue now most of the universities, where less and less empowerment for students to kind of frame, shape, and explore the way they learn is at their disposal. More and more, we have standards of learning. We have predefined ideas of what one does need to know and how they need to know it. And in many ways, do those standards get in the way of this idea that Shana brings up of freedom and power for the student? That's a question I'll throw back to you. It's an interesting one. In many ways, it's at the heart of both of these gentlemen's arguments. Empowering students in an age where the media and the information affords that empowerment like never before. Katie Sterling, another member of DS106, asked the following, or suggests the following. Students become more open to the world themselves the more they are able to identify themselves and put themselves out there. The internet allows them to create their identity and show it to others. This is an interesting point in this idea of creating one's identity. And it's a point I'll come back to in a little bit. But this idea of framing, shaping who one is, how one experiences the world through a medium whereby 
you may never meet physically the other person. That allows for people to do fakery. It allows for potentially people to pretend to be someone they are not. But at the same time, it affords the space and opportunity to think about how other people see you, even if physically they don't see you, and what that might mean. It allows us to not only think about the medium, but to become part and parcel of that medium through which we communicate. This brings me to one of the first points that someone raised about Michael Wesch's video. And this comes from Kinsey Brooks. She says this, and for her, it was a, how do I say it, a groundbreaking moment. Kinsey Brooks says, identity is what is reflected back to you. And after that, she notes, she always thought identity was something that was essential to the individual. Right? Your identity is something that was whole. It's not something that was determined by the features and people and reactions around you. And this question that Michael Wesch raises, it's a very powerful and interesting question, that your identity is reflected back to you, to the people around you, was quite powerfully brought home when he talked about his experience in New Guinea. And he talked about how his identity and how he had defined himself as a Westerner, more particularly as an American, had changed dramatically over his course of study in New Guinea, and how the environment and how the people around them changed his sense of who they are and who he was. Well, how could that be any different than us framing and thinking and shaping our sense of identity as we move into what might be considered a completely different world, a virtual world, a world where we have to even be more self-aware, a world where we have to be even more cautious in some ways about how we frame who we are. This is a very interesting point, and it gets right, in my mind, to the heart of Michael Wesch's understanding of why media and students' creation, consideration, and critiquing of media is so crucial in our moment. David Gouri brings up another point from Michael Wesch's video. He says, Michael Wesch brings up an excellent point about modern education. It's aimed to make people knowledgeable, getting to the whole title of this talk. But that's no lo longer what really matters. Knowledge, that is information, is everywhere now. And what's important is not so much obtaining it, but learning how to filter it. Wesh brings up some excellent points about the implication this has for today's learning environment. And this is a point we discussed earlier when we were talking about the journals and magazines and newspapers versus the university. And so if the university's main mission of imparting information is no longer what's necessary, given the moment we live in, then this process of filtering, of helping students critique and understand that information is what becomes its mission. And the fact is, is that we live in a media landscape right now that is dominated as much by text as it is by images, audio, and video. And one of the questions at the heart of DS-106 is how do we, in this particular environment, think about our learning environments differently? This is a large question. This is one that we have to wrestle with. But I do believe that this question of being knowledge able of being able to filter, to critique, and consider the information that we do get on the, on the internet is extremely important in this day and age. And once again, one of David, one of Michael Wesch's very powerful points. Now, Exi Herrera says the following. What hit me the most was the discussion about identity. And this question of identity comes up again and again both in Gardner Campbell's discussion as well as in Michael Wesch's. When he spoke about his experience in New Guinea, it made me realize that media is part of my identity, whether I like it or not. It forms and continues to bond people with one another. 
in forms that people perceive to be their identities. And actually brings up a very powerful point. The ways through which media and the medium frame our understanding of not only relationships, but who we are. It is that point of awareness, that understanding that the media is not simply something we consume. It is something we internalize. It is something that becomes part and parcel of who we are. And, by extension, it is something through that process that we shape. It is not a unilateral process in either way, as we often define education as unilateral, as the transaction of information from one person to the next. In fact, it is far more complex. It is a constitutive process that acts both on the receiver, which reinforces the idea of the process, and reimagines the process. Take, for example, in our particular moment, a TV show like Lost. What was unique about Lost? Well, with the new tools we have, there became a Lostopedia, a Wikipedia-like site dedicated to Lost. And this is where fans did intense research to think and imagine what Lost was doing, where the inconsistencies in the plot were, how it actually, as a show, was being shaped. And what started to happen is those fans, those consumers of the show, started to inform how that show would develop, which started to question the writers, and started to question their consistency. And there is a lot of consistency problems in Lost, believe you me. Well, this became a place where the audience wasn't just passively watching the show. And I don't think the idea of consuming is ever a completely passive process. But they had the outlet to interact, to question, to challenge, and to in many ways shape the show and the medium. It's interesting. This is more and more going to be the case as we move forward. And my question would be, how is education harnessing this power? So this question of identity and media shaping this identity is key. Thank you for that point, Exe. Again, back to Andrew Whitfield, who notes the following. He talks, and he referring to Michael Wesch, about this generation of learners being tuned out. And when he discusses this with his students, he finds that 50% of education, 50% of his students don't like school as a whole, but all of his students like to learn. So how do we, dis how do we understand the idea that while 50% of his students do not enjoy school, all of them enjoy learning? Where is the discrepancy? Where is the disconnect? Where is school failing to inspire and to encourage and to make students passionate about learning within these institutions? How have the institutions gone about denaturing learning from school? Have gone about, in many ways, making education about everything but learning? This is, in many ways, at the heart of how school as an institution operates. Has the institutionalization of school, has the attempt to make it more efficient, more tailorized, more streamlined, to serve the ultimate end of accreditation, to serve the ultimate end of degrees, in many ways killed its original purpose? Has in many ways made it somewhat unknowable to itself anymore? Has its own identity been turned to crisis? For it doesn't really know what it represents. This is a question. And it's one I believe when I talk, when Wish talks about this complete disconnect between students, school, and learning, brings a point that I think we, as professionals, both as professors, and as students need to think about, need to understand how do we 
create this space and how do we rethink it for we could say it won't happen in our moment but for many it should have happened long ago another point this will be the final point I bring up from students reactions to Wesh and Gardner Campbell's essays before I take Skype calls and there are some questions in the live chat I will get to shortly this is from Misibu both these thinkers are great participants in Paulo Freire's theory of how education should be. Do not just bank information into students' heads. Now, I want to thank Misi Bu for bringing up Paulo Freire. I think Paulo Freire in many ways has laid the groundwork for much of the educational reform, whether it might be radicalism. Another thinker who we could put in there is Ivan Illich and his whole idea of de-schooling society. These are two thinkers who in many ways have consistently been critiquing the educational structure and the institution for decades, from the 60s through. And Freire, as you refer to him, Misibu, is in many ways suggesting that school, as it has been suggested, is really about a banking concept of knowledge. The idea of exchange from one student or from the professor to the student. The idea of the oracle and the receptacle. And I do believe, Misabu, you are right, both Campbell and Wesh are reacting to this model. In fact, Wesh, in his talk, quite brilliantly, illuminates the moment where he understood that he was a dynamic professor. He understood that he could seduce his students in some way to enjoying what he was doing, and he could have gone on like that. But at the same point, this idea of being a professor who's dynamic and passionate and can communicate well did not change the nature of the questions from his students. And it's at this point that he scrapped what he was doing and he decided to bring them into the endeavor. That's not only a powerful move on his part, but it's also a moment where he is breaking directly, as you mentioned, Freire, from that point. It's a powerful one, and it's well brought up. Now, we do have a question from the live chat, so let me turn to that now. Okay. So this is from Abby. Thank you for commenting, Abby. And she says, where are instances of communicating with various pressers, uh, professors? What is the way out? And how do you propose this way with a rapid advancement of technology? Now, if I'm reading your question right, Abby, and let me know if I'm not. This idea of communicating with professors and various professors has changed dramatically with technology. And I believe one of the things that have come up and I've heard again and again is that professors are not prepared to deal with the instant communication. In many ways, Dr. Oblivion, through his technical assistant, Jim Groom, is constantly communicating with students. And in an online environment like this, part of the expectation in our moment is that you will have rapid feedback that you will have instant feedback, that the physical space where you get that in the classroom in many ways changes when you move to the online space. And I believe if you're doing a class online, you should have, if not yourself, some mechanism like a gym groom whereby you can communicate immediately with students and you can actually interact with them not simply in our traditional privilege model of the face-to-face -face classroom, but also online, whether it be through email, Twitter, or a series of other forms. What I'd like to actually communicate now, or talk to a little bit, is some of the video responses we've gotten via YouTube. And yet another way to communicate both Leel Zabub and Shano Tate did a half-hour, three-set series in response to 
the good Dr. Oblivion. And what they basically argued and talked about was their reflection upon WESH, upon the changing nature of education. And through this medium, they became and given a space to speak. And not only that, through the idea of video, as you're experiencing right now, they became embodied in some different way, in some different form. Chelsea also experimented with the video, as did Tim Owens, as did Shell Cullen. And this idea of the video response is not something I only want to kind of applaud, but I want to encourage. I think this idea of a voice right now, Dr. Oblivion's voice, which until we go to Skype will seem somewhat unilateral, somewhat monotone, somewhat more of the same. I think we can change this if you begin to take over the broadcast, if you begin to interrupt and interact and override any one sensibility. For Dr. Oblivion is always already mediated and you have the same privilege to mediate your opinions and thoughts and it's up to you to take that opportunity. Now, I am going to turn to the Skype calls and I would actually, I will be accepting calls right now, but in the meantime, there's a couple of things I want to talk about until someone um, is brave enough to call. Oh, we have a call. So immediately, we have a call and let's go. Let me make sure I have it. Okay, give me one second. And I will bring over. Okay. And let me try this. Excellent. Great. Abby, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Great. Okay, let me see. Can you still hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, let me, there might be a little bit of an echo. Abby, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, okay, good. And here you are. Do you have a video camera? Do you have a video camera? Yes, I do. Okay, we got this. Put it on? Yeah, give me one second. We got this echo, though. Thought I had this figured out. Oh, great. Okay, let me try this. Okay. All right, let's see if this works. Okay, what's your question, Abby? Well, I guess that um, so far what I've gotten from the class is that... Oh, I'm going to have to take this out because I can't hear you. <laughs> Dr. Oblivion is having problems. Hello. 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 Yeah. yeah. So I see that we keep so pushing for, for much more virtual communication, communication in the classroom. In the classroom. However, However, in classes that I have been where the only means of communicating with the teacher is through the media or through other forms of technology. There have been so much problems of maybe language barriers, miscommunication, and then it's just been a little confusing as to meeting the person face to face to talk or ask a question. And I know that one of the reasons that I realized was because I'm African and I have an accent and I write differently. So when I'm not talking to you, but I'm not emailing or I'm chatting with you, I may ask a question that may come across as that you may interpret differently. And I feel like we are pushing for so much more virtual communication, but we are not doing much to solve these problems of language barriers and a miscommunication between the sender of the message and the receiver of the message. So for you, in relationship to both Wesh's and Gardner Campbell's, what are some ways at that problem to change the way we communicate through these virtual spaces? 
Yes, and not yes. to make and it not to make it the only source of communication out there. I think that it should be an alternative to the face-to-face -face communication that we are all, like the traditional forms of communication that we have right now. Yes. So what, what would be a way, like for example, you Skyping in to communicate. You could never see Dr. Oblivion face-to-face, -face, but right now we're still mediated through the camera. And does that still represent some particular problems? It, it, it does. I think that this helps a lot. But I'm talking of a scenario where I don't have the option to type with you, where I can only live chat, or I don't even have an internet service to get through to you. I, we, we, we are pretty much focused on it and pretending that everybody has internet access and everybody has the technological know-how to communicate through media. Let me ask you this, Abby. Given our moment when so much of that communication is being mediated through the internet, and I would imagine much of your courses, maybe outside of DS-106, don't particularly ask you to use your computer in the same way, to actually go through live chat, Twitter, YouTube, Skype, whatever you have. How can this, in many ways, be a space for you to start exploring and imagining what it means and the challenges that are represented by communicating through this medium? Because we can't pretend that this medium is going away. In fact, it's going to more and more dominate the world in which we live. So part of the experience of this class, in my mind, is for asking you and all the students out there to frame a voice, an identity, whereby you can communicate effectively using these tools. Now, you're right. It does assume an internet connection. It does assume that we are online. So how do you consider that as a challenge and as a way to kind of work through that, like you would work through trying to write a paper for your first time? It's, it's probably a question that I, I would be able to answer more by the end of the class. But right yeah. now, I think that I wouldn't make it the only option out there for communicating. More avenues of even virtual communication should be explored, depending on the situation of maybe the receiver or the sender. So to answer your question, I, I think that I'll be very, I'll give you a much more effective or efficient answer in probably the third or fourth week of the class, where I have well, let me ask, so much more. Let me ask you this. Would an option of, say, not writing a blog post, but responding through a YouTube video that you record, or through becoming into these daily Dr. Oblivion lectures as a commentator, or as a way, in many ways, to come through Twitter in a much shorter space, to speak through, which we're going to be doing shortly, pictures, audio, video, communicate something in a space that's quite different from what we're used to in the university environment, which is usually the research paper, a certain amount of length, right, a literature review of a certain amount of length, my question to you would be, where do you think you want to explore and build upon a kind of means of communicating that in many ways we will not, however we frame it, meet face to face? So what tools will you bring that you know about to change that mode of communication that works for you? That to me is one of the great challenges of this class. What I like about it in relationship to Campbell and Wesh is the responsibility now falls back to you. No one's saying you can't use any tool. The tool you choose, the ones you experiment with, even if they fail, doesn't mean you will fail. It means you've been living to the point of this class, which is exploring and experimenting with how you represent yourself effectively online. That to me is one of the greatest possibilities. This is an experimentation. You are being asked and encouraged to experiment. Uh, it's, 
you, you're throwing so many hard questions at me, considering I'm not the most, uh, the most technological advanced person out there, but it's, it sounds like a pretty good thing to me. I would use, I'm pretty happy about the whole idea of making a video and maybe blogging, except that I think that with the whole, I have a problem with a video, if I'm answering your, your question correctly, with a video because there are times when just the presence of having a, a camera in front of you even makes you nervous. Yeah. Whereas when I'm blogging, I have my, uh, I'm in the comfort of my own face and I can pretty much put everything out there and I don't have my face up for the whole world to see. So I feel comfortable knowing that whatever information I'm putting out there is not biased or I'm not trying to watch what I say because if I should say it in a certain way, people see my face and people might actually end up commenting on my appearance instead of the information that I'm putting up there. So for me, writing, blogging will be like the best way to communicate something out there, not necessarily with a video. The video can be some sort of a plus an addition to what you blog if you want have anything extra to say or if you want to live chat with people and then ask them hey what is your take on what i blogged then the whole idea of the of the video can come in because for me this is very different um i think that i i'm i'm learning more about myself by actually taking this class because we have to do video chats and then i have to myself a esteem issues or my personal issues aside and then do it for the purpose of the class. And then by doing that, I'm growing as a person as well. And one of the things you bring up that I really like, Abby, and I think gets to the point of this class, is at some level, it should ask you, and you should ask it, if it is a thing, what it means to communicate through a medium of expression and what that means for us every time we're communicating, arguing, to at the same time consider how that reflects and builds and imparts upon our identity. I think it's something that we kind of assume as we go through university. But one of the most powerful things about university is that it's a unique, intense space and time period that shapes who we are. That is part of the building of an identity. And I think being reflective about that process at a point for a specific period of time can be very useful as you move forward. So I would think about the very things you're talking about. Do you communicate better through the text and the blog? What are the challenges for you with video? Or communicating through images? Or sound? But reflecting on that process, there's no one right way to do it. But there is a kind of intensive practice a personal and hopefully a peer network feedback that can hopefully benefit you. And I'm excited about that because I'm not putting limitations on you, how you do it, how you imagine it. But I'm asking you to engage it and to consider it and reflect upon that process. Now Jim Groom might have different ideas, but Dr. Oblivion believes that. In many ways, this is the kind of point of this class. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Very helpful. Very helpful. <laughs> well, thank you, Abby, yeah. for calling in. You are our first official caller Yay. on Dr. Oblivion's Yay. TV show. So even though you have problems with video, you do it quite well. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Abby. Okay. Excellent. And I'm not sure if we have any other callers, but in the meantime, I want to experiment with a series of images that Julia Forsyth had been experimenting with. Well, actually, this is Stella Meme. So let me see if I can get this. I'll put me down.
Okay, let's see. Okay. So now you should be seeing the computer screen. And if you notice, a Stella meme has actually experimented with an animated GIF. You've all been asked to do an animated GIF. And many of you did with your favorite film or what have you. What I love about what Stella Meme has done here, she's taken an idea of the personal cyber infrastructure and the retinal scan and kind of expressed the ideas of Gardner Campbell through an animated GIF. And even gone on, if you look here, to take the very disturbing image of, from Brazil of this facelift that Gardner Campbell talks about. And he actually, and she, or he or she, I'm not sure, brings that image to life to further reinforce Gardner Campbell's idea. And you'll notice the blinking blackboard, which is just brilliantly done. And I love this idea of taking a stand and expressing an idea about a present, presentation visually. It's a powerful concept. And the way she goes about it, or he goes about it, is very powerful. So the animated GIF as actual interpretive tool for the work we're doing. It's very powerful. Now, Julia Forsyth has done something quite powerful with visualization as well. Take a look at this. This is a kind of visual representation of the ideas of Gardner Campbell's talk. You'll see the no digital facelifts image, thinking the unthinkable. And there's also the three recursive practices, curation, narration, curation, and sharing. The idea of us all being system administrators of our own lives, right? The beautiful music and the harmony, grand harmonies of the sphere, the cyber infrastructure, this idea of a meaningful feedback loop, it's all here in the seat panel. This is a beautiful representation in a way of kind of reading the essay visually. And this is important because DS-106 will now be moving into the visual portion of the class. We're already doing the daily shoots on a daily basis. The next step now is to start doing some of the visual assignments in the repository. So we'll be talking about that shortly. The other thing, if you haven't seen it, is Julia Forsyth has also done a representation of Michael Wesch's From Knowledgeable to Knowledge Able for new media environments. And you'll notice that there's a whole series of different images. And I would strongly suggest, and when we post the discussion notes from this session, we will bring this up as one possible way of thinking about representing the way you read, the way you think, and the experiences you have in this class is visually. And it's extremely important, and I wanted to highlight this work by Julia Forsyth because we're moving in to the visual portion of this course. Now, I'm going to quickly take back shot and I will go back to Dr. Oblivion. Now I'm not sure if we have any more callers in on Skype. Um, I will check. Um, it does not seem like we do. So with this, I will actually begin to frame both tomorrow and the rest of the week. We are now ending, tomorrow we'll be ending week one of DS-106. And this is where the idea of the students now both creating from a pool of assignments that have already been populated by previous DS-106 students, but also hopefully adding their own assignments. You'll notice on the DS-106 site, there's an assignments tab, submit an assignment. Within that tab, there's a series of different possibilities, visual assignment, design assignment, audio, video, all of which we'll be covering. I will shortly be sending out an assignment for the visual portion while I'll be asking all of the DS-106 students 
to do a certain number of visual assignments and also to submit a visual assignment of their own creation and conception. So for the next four to five days, all of us in DS-106 will be creating visual assignments and we'll be experimenting with the existing visual assignments to build upon them. There's a very specific way to both submit and to tag these assignments. So I'll put out that out in the post which will accompany this video. And with that, I am going to end day three of Dr. Oblivion's discussion. Thank you, Abby, for calling in. And thank you for all the comments in the blogs that we got. Now keep in mind, and I want to reiterate this because it's extremely important, you need to be reading and commenting on one another's blogs. As Abby said, there are many avenues for communication. One of the most important is the regular reflection and reading of other people's work and commenting. Please, please, please do not wait for Jim Groom or anyone else to comment on your work to make it somewhat official. Everyone needs to comment on everyone else's work. We're a part of this. To be commenting is to be engaging and participating in this class. If you're not commenting, in my mind, you're not participating. So please, and make the comments thoughtful. Good work will only take you so far. And with that, I end day three of DS-106.